just wanted to remind everyone to turn your cell phones on the silent. You can turn your paper off for all the residents. This morning, our first uh, present presentation is going to be by Dr. Copeland. So here she is. Thanks, Allison. Is Mike operating okay? Does everyone have one of these little clickers? I'm testing this out for the upcoming board review, and I want to make sure that it, everything works properly. So, Jim Myers, do you have one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Fun to be here today. Um, two people I want to thank, Teresa Jenkins and Daniel up in the box up there. Without them, this presentation would never have come together. Thank you, Teresa. I really appreciate you. Is this mic? Is it okay? Okay, good. Um, this first slide is a fun slide <clears throat> in that uh, yesterday we all got the mass email about the uh, conference this morning and it listed my credentials as being the division chief for pulmonary critical care as well as the fellowship director. So what do I do? I promptly texted my buddy Jim Myers and uh, he texted me back saying he had real grave concerns for the Department of Internal Medicine and for the College of Medicine and the university as a whole if they put me in the role. So anyway, thanks for the vote of confidence, Jim. <laughs> um, I am also not an occupational medicine specialist. I had to do a lot of work on my own trying to ferret out information and uh, <clears throat> pertinent things that I thought I should bring to this talk. Um, I've had literally no training in occupational medicine, but what I wanted to do was divide the talk into two parts. The first part is kind of sort of fluff, but just interesting information uh, about the specialty itself, uh, both nationally and internationally. And the second part is the real meat of the matter. These are testable questions. I got the questions from two sources from MixApp and from the equivalent from the occupational medicine side, uh, their, their occupational medicine board review book that the department graciously uh, provided funding for. So I've got two really credible sources for the questions. There are 10 or 11 questions, and these are questions to the best of my recollection from my last research um, topics that are covered. So without any further uh, talk, we'll get into the uh, presentation itself, I, obviously I don't have any sort of financial, uh, what do they call it, interest here, and I'm not talking about any drugs or any uh, off-label things. Okay, uh, brief overview and history of occupational medicine. The Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970 assures every working man and woman in the United States safe and health, healthful working conditions. This act created the, uh, what we know as OSHA and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. I'm assuming that's abbreviated NIOSH. I'm pronouncing it that way. That may be incorrect. At the time that OSHA was passed, occupational medicine was one of the country's smallest medical specialties with only a few residency trained specialists in academic positions, consulting practices, or employed by major corporations. NIOSH funds most training programs in occupational health and safety. Currently, uh, NIOSH funds support a training program that consists of a network of 16 regional education and research centers located at 14 universities or uh, universities in 14 states and that's current as of about six months ago. Every year approximately 500 students in occupational medicine, occupational health nursing, industrial hygiene and safety sciences graduate from NIOSH supported programs. There are currently 30 approved physician residency programs in the United States. This is down from 40 10 years ago. Of note, most training programs in occupational medicine are associated with universities that have schools of public health rather than colleges of medicine. Interestingly, among the medical schools that required the teaching of occupational medicine in 1985, 
the mean required curriculum time over four years was four hours. And just a bit of history here, I graduated from medical school in 1982, and I think I had one hour of training and no additional training at all. In the intervening time since 1985, there's been almost no change in the percentage of medical schools specifically teaching occupational medicine to medical students. The mean number of required hours of occupational health teaching to medical students has increased by only two hours from four to six. This is at the medical student level. The mean number of faculty members per school who are teaching occupational health has remained unchanged since 1977, and that would be the year before I started med school. Distance learning of occupational medicine augments and soon may replace the short course programs. Tulane, the Medical College of Wisconsin, and University of North Carolina all provide distance education Master of Public Health degree programs for physicians and nurses. The American Board of Preventive Medicine began board certification of specialists in occupational medicine in 1955. The number of residency trained occupational physicians certified by ABPM is not replacing losses. Total number of new board certifications in occupational medicine has now, now fallen back below 100 per year nationwide. Okay, we'll talk just a bit about occupational medicine as it relates to the United States. Occupational injuries and illnesses are among the five leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the United States and also in most other countries. There are at least 55,000 occupational fatalities each year, ranking the workplace as the eighth leading cause of death. Since the early 1970s, more than 113,000 worker deaths were attributed to pneumoconiosis. However, this number represents only a small portion of the total deaths attributable to occupational lung disease. number of deaths from asbestos-related mesothelioma has been increasing steadily in the same time period as our deaths from hypersensitivity pneumonitis as an underlying or contributing cause. And I'll have more on this later, including in the question section. Asthma is now the most common occupational respiratory disease. Population-based estimates suggest that approximately 20% of all new onset asthma in adults is work-related. <coughs> Occupational injuries are significantly underreported, yet 3.8 million recognized disabling injuries still occur every year here in the United States. One-third of all injuries result in loss of work. The human costs associated with occupational injuries and illnesses are staggering. Financial costs of occupational injuries and illnesses exceed 150 billion per year, not million, billion. A bit about international occupational health. It's much bleaker than in the United States. Working conditions for the majority of the world's workers do not meet the minimum standards and guidelines set by the International Labor Organization and the World Health Organization. Progress in bringing occupational health to industrializing countries is extremely slow, and in the poorest countries, there's been no progress at all. From the international perspective, the ILO estimates that the world's workforce suffers more than one billion, billion accidents every year, leading to losses of more than 6% of national incomes. In the world's poorest countries, only about 2% of occupational disease is actually recognized and reported. Occupational diseases are now deemed an epidemic in developing countries, and if these countries continue their current rate of industrial growth, 
the number of occupational injuries and disease cases will double by 2025. The ILO reports that occupational health and safety laws cover only 10% of the working population in developing countries and that such laws omit many major hazardous industries and occupations including agriculture, fishing, forestry, construction, small-scale enterprises, and the informal sector where much of the world's workforce is located. In summary, over the next 20 years, the population of developed countries will fall slightly, whereas the developing world will acquire 2 billion more people, many of them in countries that are currently political and economic failures. In such a world, occupational health is not likely to make much progress, and elevation of work standards will remain a near impossible goal. I spent some time over at the med school library preparing for this talk, and I went online and looked at various resources over there at the library. I was trying to get an update on the most current things. And when I reviewed the current literature regarding advances in occupational medicine and considerations for the future, the overwhelming emphasis was placed in the international arena and the multitude of above identified problems faced by the developing world with all too few resources in their arsenals. Painted a fairly bleak picture. Okay, now we get to the fun stuff. Get your clickers out. And uh, I'll read the question, give you ample time. Let me know if I go too, too fast through these. Uh, which of the following is correct regarding occupational asthma? A, bronchial provocation tests such as methicoline are useful in assessing patients. B, onset of symptoms may be abrupt and in the workplace. C, once the diagnosis of occupational asthma is established, prompt job transfer to an area of no exposure is advised. D, onset of symptoms may be delayed for several hours after exposure, and E, all of the above. So give me the correct response here. And this is going to give a bar graph to the audience response. Okay, excellent. All of the above. That is correct. Occupational asthma is relatively common, can affect up to 10% of young adults. There are over 200 sensitizing agents that have been identified. It can be suspected when symptoms improve during weekends and holidays. If the index person is removed from exposure within the first six months of symptoms, there's usually complete recovery. Duration of symptoms greater than six months before removal is a strong risk factor for progressive disease even after removal from the workplace. Okay, next question. They're wanting the incorrect response here regarding hypersensitivity pneumonitis. A, it commonly results from bacteria emphani, Jim, is that it? Yeah, okay. And various fungi. It has findings that suggest recurrent pneumonia. C, it's an immune disease mediated by IgE. D, it is thought that T lymphocytes are important in pathogenesis. And lastly, chest x-ray and serum findings are nonspecific. So again, choose the incorrect response here. All right, kind of a mixed bag here. 45% uh, went with uh, so selection A, 32% selection D. 
The correct answer is C. This is incorrect. Hypersensitivity pneumonitis involves a T lymphocyte response to inhaled antigens, not, not IgE. Patients with hypersensitivity pneumonitis typically present with recurring episodes of fever, cough, headache, dyspnea, and generalized malaise that could mimic acute infectious disease. There may be a progression to pulmonary fibrosis with a restrictive ventilatory defect. Prognosis is good if the patient presents before pulmonary fibrosis is extensive and if they are removed from the offending agent. Farmer's lung is a type of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I don't know if we have any medical students in the audience, but always ask on the step exam, what we used to call part one, part two. Uh, they always ask about farmer's lung. So if you haven't read up on that, that's usually a testable question. Yes. Jim, thanks. I did not know that. And that's available at the Med Center as well as the VA. What about through all scripts? Like, could I go upstairs and get it? Okay, good. Thank you. This is a, a busy slide. I just put this in here to show you that there's a multitude of inciting agents, bacteria, fungi, amoeba, animal proteins, chemicals, etc. Great, Jim, thanks. Okay, next question. Pneumoconioses are dust inhalation diseases that are characterized by chest x-ray abnormalities and clinical respiratory impairment. Which one of the following, again, which one is false about pneumoconioses? A, asbestosis is a form of interstitial lung fibrosis. B, Ferruginous bodies are composed of an asbestos fiber that has been attacked by alveolar macrophages with resulting deposition of iron and proteins. C, pulmonary TB is infrequently seen in patients with silicosis. And D, the term asbestosis includes pleural thickening. Which one of these is false? Okay, ready? You got that right. 77% uh, gave the uh, correct response. Answer C, the risk of pulmonary tuberculosis is increased in patients with silicosis. Silicosis is the most common pneumoconiosis worldwide. There's an increased risk of silicosis in workers in mines, blasting, drilling, foundries, sandblasting, and those working in pottery, porcelain, glass, and granite cutting. Asbestosis causes diffuse pleural thickening, and it increases the risk of mesothelioma, as you all know. 
the single most important risk factor for the development of asbestos-related lung disease is the extent of exposure. Those working in construction, automotive servicing, and shipbuilding are most commonly affected by asbestosis. More than 30 million tons of asbestos have been mined in the past century. I mean, just to think about it, 30 million tons. Asbestos is one of the most pervasive environmental hazards in the world. It is present in more than 3,000 manufactured products. All forms of asbestos can result in asbestosis, lung cancer, and mesothelioma. Asbestos exposure affects not only asbestos workers, but also their families and the public exposed to building materials and asbestos in heating and ventilating systems. Worldwide, about 20 to 40 percent of adult men report some past jobs that may have entailed asbestos exposure. It is predicted that the asbestos cancer epidemic may take as many as 10 million lives before asbestos is banned worldwide. Just, a, just an aside, Jim Myers and I go way, way, way back to grade school together. We grew up here on this campus. Jim, do you remember when they had to close Dossett Hall and completely gut Dossett Hall over on the undergrad campus to get rid of asbestos? Um, Okay, question. When evaluating a patient with suspected contact dermatitis, we're shifting gears here, from an occupational exposure, the physician should do all of the following except, A, take a complete history, including the occupational history, perform a skin biopsy to establish the work-relatedness, C, tour the work site if feasible, D, perform a complete skin exam and review the relevant material safety data sheet. And you did great. A question on the way the boards are. You want to stay away. You don't want to choose the most invasive uh, option or the most expensive option. The answer is B. Hand dermatitis is particularly common in individuals working in industries involving cleaning, catering, metalwork, hairdressing, gardening. Healthcare mechanical work occurs hours to days after contact has occurred because we're all medical here. Remember latex allergy in healthcare workers, and this is a typical example of a latex allergy. Okay, which of the following skin neoplasms is or associated with occupational exposure to sun? You have melanoma, squamous cell, basal, A and B, or all three. Okay, again, you did well. 70% chose all three. That is indeed correct. All three are associated with sun exposure. Just some pictures here. Uh, melanoma. <clears throat> this is a typical picture of a squamous cell carcinoma on the lip and on the ear. And the basal cell, look at the heaped up pearly borders. Next question, which of the following statements about occupational Raynaud's disease and vibration white finger is false? A, in addition to blanching, numbness and tingling can occur. B, better tool design and selection can reduce the frequency of the disease. C, only those with underlying primary Raynaud's are affected. 
D, disease occurs in those um, individuals working with handheld vibrating tools. And lastly, in more severe cases, the thumb may be involved. Which of these stems would be false? <clears throat> Ready? That is correct, absolutely. Uh, again, a question about wording that you'll find on the boards. When you see stems that have only something of that, don't choose that one for the most part. So stem C is false. The disease is seen in workers that use handheld vibrating, <clears throat> excuse me, vibrating tools such as chainsaws and jackhammers. Remember that primary Raynaud's disease is a completely separate entity caused by other factors and is not the cause of occupational Raynaud's. All right, next question. A 55-year-old woman presents with the complaint of pain at the base of the right thumb when she pinches the burling tool. The likeliest diagnosis is which of the following? Dr. Doss and I were talking about this just yesterday. A, early carpal tunnel syndrome, de Quervain's tenosynovitis, osteoarthritis of the first carpometacarpal joint, D, rheumatoid, and E, radial nerve entrapment, which is the likeliest diagnosis here. Answer here is uh, the audience response was a, a bit mixed. The actual correct answer is C, osteoarthritis. It's common. It's much more common than carpal tunnel syndrome. Arthritis of the first carpometacarpal joint is a common cause of pain at the base of the thumb, particularly in women beyond middle age. The most common entrapment neuropathy of the upper extremity is carpal tunnel syndrome, but that's not what we're dealing with here. If nerve conduction studies are used as the gold standard, the classical symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome are not good screening tools because of their low predictive value. With any hint, and this is probably the most important statement I'll give you from this slide, when you get out in private practice or even in your residency training in your continuity clinics in the outpatient sector, with any hint of muscle atrophy, you want to refer that patient to a hand specialist. And remember that the initial treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome, again, not what we're dealing with in reference to this question, but with carpal tunnel syndrome, you want to do wrist splinting and avoidance of repetitive wrist motions. Okay, they're asking for the correct response here. Which of the following statements is our correct concerning exposure to lead? This was, to the best of my recollection, may not be worded exactly as such, but if I remember correctly, this, this question and the, the content of this question was on my last recertification exam. So, lead exposure. A, acute and chronic encephalopathy may result from lead exposure. B, abdominal pain and constipation are not associated with lead exposure. C, sources of lead exposure include insecticides, lead-based paint, storage batteries, reclamation operations, and illicit whiskey. Parkinsonism is a chronic, chronic manifestation of lead exposure. And lastly, uh, they are saying statements A and C are both correct. <clears throat> Thank you. 
You ready? Okay, 97% put uh, selection E. You're absolutely right. Parkinsonism is a feature of manganese and carbon disulfide toxicity, not lead. Abdominal pain and constipation are clinical features associated with acute lead poisoning. Very good. Okay, inhalation of lead fumes during burning operations is the most common source of acute lead occupational poisoning. Burning of lead-based paints during home remodeling can result in similar intense exposure. Early diagnosis and treatment will generally result in complete recovery. Once renal or neurologic impairment has occurred, you can expect only partial recovery. Next question, which of the following statements is least correct about work-related infections? Again, which one is least correct? A, the type of infections for which workers are at risk is largely dependent on the type of work that they do. The occupations at risk tend to be those in which individuals have close or frequent contact with other humans and animals. C, healthcare is one of the highest risk occupations for exposure to infectious disease. D, HIV exposure is a definite risk for healthcare, laboratory, and home healthcare workers. And lastly, the seroconversion rate after a needle stick with HIV positive blood is estimated to be 10%. Which one is least correct here? Sixty-eight percent put uh, E, the seroconversion rate after a needle stick with HIV positive blood is estimated to, to be about 10 percent. That is indeed the correct response. It, that is the least correct stem. The seroconversion rate after a needle stick, Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, what I read, it's about 0 0.3 percent. Uh, Post-exposure, and Jim, this is what I need you to help me with because I'm not sure that the textbook I use is the latest stuff out. Post-exposure prophylaxis from unknown blood source is a combination of Truvada and Isentris for 28 days. If you have post-exposure uh, from a known blood source, use the same HIV regimen being used for the blood source patient for 28 days. Is that right, Jim?
Thank you, Jim. Okay, just a word about hepatitis C and healthcare worker associated risk. Current estimate for transmission of HCV following a needle stick injury from a positive carrier is approximately 1.8. But did you say three? Okay. Gotcha. Transmission following a mucous membrane exposure is very rare with no apparent transfer following exposure to intact skin. Is that your, is that also your, um, okay. Chronic carriers have a 20% chance of developing cirrhosis and an increased risk for developing hepatocellular carcinoma. Consider HCV RNA testing two to four weeks after exposure to known HCV positive blood or blood products. Is that what you do, Jim? Okay. A recent study seemed, now recent, this was a textbook from 2000, late 2012 that I was using. So recent studies seem to indicate that treatment of early seroconversion with interferon alpha, possibly with ribavirin, may prevent chronic carrier states. And there's no indication for the use of immune globulin in the post-exposure management of these cases. Again, Jim, I'm going to pick your brain. Is that correct? Just getting to economics, you, you mentioned $100,000. Do any insurances cover that? Some do, but it's a lot of paperwork. Okay. Next question. You have a factory worker. 44-year-old is evaluated for acute low back pain. Five days ago while at work, he bent to lift heavy equipment, felt a popping sensation in his back with radiation down the right leg. Pain worsened over the next two to three days. He started taking over-the-counter ibuprofen with some degree of improvement. He currently rates his pain as about a 5 out of 10. There have been no neurologic sequelae, no numbness, no weakness, no bowel or bladder incontinence. Physical exam is normal with the exception of some degree of discomfort when working. So you are the work workers' comp physician and this patient presents to you what is the most appropriate management of this patient. A, NSAIDs, B, CBC and SED rate, C, send the patient over to Turney Williams to get an epidural corticosteroid injection, D, lumbar MRI, or plain films, plain lumbar films. What would you do? Certainly not a workers' comp doctor, but my residents and I see this all the time, don't we, Debelina? Don't we, Jason? Okay. 62% said to use um, NSAIDs. Another 34% said get lumbar plane films. The correct answer, and I, I will be the first to say, sometimes I jump the gun and I will... I'll get lumbar plane films. But the correct response is A, NSAIDs. The overall prognosis for acute musculoskeletal low back pain is excellent. Don't go for the invasive things. Don't get your nurse to try to get prior approval for an MRI. That's inappropriate. It's not the correct thing to do. And for sure, avoid narcotics. Don't we do that, Debelina? Okay. Oh, we're at the end. Here's my bibliography and a funny cartoon. That's all I've got. Thank you so much.